So our next panel is going to be on managing supply chain risks and disruptions. And we have three esteemed panelists joining us today. First, we have Aisha Brown. And since 2019, Aisha Brown has served as Michigan's first ever election security specialist. Ms. Brown is dedicated to coordinating Michigan's overall election security plan and working with state and federal partners to assess, train, and communicate with local election officials on election security best practices. Then we have with us Ed Smith, and Ed Smith is the Director of Global Services and Certification in North America for Smartmatic. In this role, Ed oversees service delivery as well as U.S. federal and state certification. He also serves as subject matter expert in areas of system development, process improvement, and product enhancement, as well as technical pre-sales uh, product lines. Relevant to today's conversation, Ed also serves as the chair of the Sector Coordinating Council. And then we also have Jim Server. Jim is the Vice President of Business Development for Runbeck Election Services. Jim leads Runbeck's business development and strategic growth initiatives in all state and partner counties. Relevant for today's conversation, Jim is currently serving as the co-chair of the Sector Coordinating Council Supply Chain Working Group. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here today. And thank you very much uh, for having us and for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, once again, I'm Ed Smith. I'm with Smartmatic. But today, uh, I'm here uh, as part of the Sector Coordinating Council and to talk about supply chain. I'm going to start and then hand it over to uh, Jim Suver for a discussion of paper. And then I'll take it back for, for hardware and services. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to Ms. Brown for her remarks. Uh, so once again, thank you. Uh, so over a year ago, the Sector Coordinating Council started an effort which led to a working group, uh, which was a rather large working group, associated to supply chain risk management. You, like us, have probably been hearing about supply chain uh, for that period of time. Ultimately, that large working group divided into four smaller working groups, and each addressed uh, one of these, hardware, software, services, and, and paper and allied products. And the objectives of those groups are, are here on the slide. I'm not going to read them all. But it was basically to put forth information to the larger elections ecosystem with respect to what was happening in the supply chain realm, uh, supply chains that serve all of us, whether we're, we're county, states, uh, election technology providers, or hold some other part of the ecosystem, and primarily what to do to mitigate risks of supply disruptions, meaning you can't get what you need to get, when you need to get it, and where you need to get it. Uh, and also then supply chain integrity risks, meaning uh, perhaps you didn't get what you thought uh, you were going to get, or somehow it had been tampered with, and once again, wasn't what you thought you were going to get. And so we put forth uh, two publications, really th three, uh, two uh, papers, one dealing with paper and allied products, the other uh, grouping hardware, software, and services together, and then the infographic, which, uh, which Kim and uh, Jeff uh, showed on a slide earlier, uh, which we have on the slide uh, as well. I'm sorry? Okay. Oh, thank you, Amy. There we go. So with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to Jim, and we'll talk about ballot paper and envelopes. All right, thank you, Ed, and uh, thank you, Amy, thank you, Megan, uh, for the time today. So uh, as Ed had mentioned, we had started with this uh, process uh, back, in, um, back in the end of 21, and um, we just wanted to discuss some of these issues and, and what we have in front of us. You all are very familiar with this subject. I do know because we've been talking with uh, jurisdictions in your states, but uh, the U.S. and Canadian mills have been closing. That's been a trend uh, over the years, over the, certainly over the last decade. 
there's been a much higher demand in cardboard for online ordering through the pandemic, as well as a larger demand for what uh, I refer to as bleach board, and that is packaging, if you will, like Crest toothpaste. That packaging has been under very high demand uh, for the packaging of the vials for the vaccine, as well as for COVID uh, testing. So that packaging is very popular. Uh, with the mills converting over to the production of uh, these types of products, then the supply and, and, and uh, production for ballot paper, envelopes, inserts, all that, uh, has waned. And so they never anticipated uh, this type of crunch to happen when they're making these decisions, when these mills are making these decisions in 2020, that this crunch then comes in 2022. So we've also had labor shortages. You're very familiar with that. You know that in your respective states and your offices alone. And then uh, we've also just had global pressures on the paper industry as well. So when we look at the assets at risk, um, there are several. Uh, certainly the paper supply is the leanest it has ever been. Uh, and it's not just envelope, or it's not just ballots, it's also the envelopes and the inserts and I voted stickers and uh, voter information guides, paper needed for, for all those uh, statutorily mandated uh, items. Um, packaging even is limited when we're shipping all this all this paper uh, out to the states and jurisdictions, uh, the packaging, we're having limitations on that. And um, we just wanna encourage that you're, you are doing this, we know you're doing this uh, in, in your states and in your jurisdictions, but that you're continuing to encourage them to make sure that their vendors have uh, the paper they need uh, to make sure they can get through the election. Uh, we've had transportation risks. We've heard about that over the years. Uh, again, back to labor shortages. And uh, the biggest uh, risk we have is when we come up to uh, the days of E minus 15, E minus 10, and we have some type of urgent request. Uh, that is going to be a biggest, the biggest risk, the ability to do last minute reprints or larger reprints. Um, we're not saying that won't be able to be done throughout uh, the industry, but uh, that is just another item that is at risk. And then finally, just to continue co to communicate with your jurisdictions, um, certainly by now we're in middle of July, your jurisdictions have to have ordered by now for November. Um, I have heard some rumblings that some have not ordered uh, or made those place those orders with their vendors. Please just make sure your jurisdictions are doing so. Uh, uh, they are uh, extremely late, uh, but uh, those are, <laughs> uh, we just have to encourage them to make sure all their orders in are for, for November. Uh, those orders are very important um, and certainly the estimates going forward I hate to already start talking about uh, next year and 24, but uh, those estimates are very important they're, and they're certainly better than your service providers uh, estimates and guesses. Uh, misinformation, the MDM, uh, I have seen it out there and we have seen it out there that uh, there are people saying this, there's no paper crisis, there's no paper supply chain crisis in the election space. Uh, that is just not true. Um, you all know that, but I just had to mention it. It, it has popped up and I, I see tweets about it, social media things, and it's just uh, completely unfounded and for sure uh, MDM. Uh, take a look at the uh, supply chain risk management uh, artifact that we uh, produced and continue your planning. Uh, it is you well know better than anyone that uh, after November, we're down to 12, 13 months, and um, we have to really start planning for that. We have a few states that are in caucus and early primary in January and February, and then once March hits of 2024, um, we have to be ready for the election cycle. All this to say, we need to have all our paper in our facilities uh, throughout the country at the end of December of 23.
So that is, uh, concludes my remarks and comments. So I'll hand it over here. Mr. Smith. All righty, thank you, Jim. So I'm going to speak just a little bit on hardware and services. You'll notice I'm leaving off software because that's probably a done deal. Uh, if you're talking uh, voting system software, you, you probably have what you're going to use. In November, many states uh, disallow changes at this point in time uh, regardless, uh, but it's not such a supply chain issue as uh, is hardware and services. Uh, so like paper, both uh, demand uh, increases and, and supply increases and the pandemic have all conspired to, to create a, a hardware uh, supply chain disruption. Uh, and that is that lead times for devices uh, have gone out uh, to levels uh, like we saw in the Y2K era of, of 99 and into 2000. Uh, we've also seen prices uh, for hardware go up quite a lot. Uh, it is plausible that your, your election technology provider uh, has shortages uh, of inventory and like paper, if you're not already talking to them and you feel that you have counties that will need some extra devices for November, uh, you really need to get started with that uh, right away. Uh, like paper, having forecasts, having uh, discussions, having orders uh, in hand uh, are certainly tools that speak large to resolving supply chain disruptions uh, and issues. Um, candid discussions, regardless uh, of needs, of what your election technology provider has on hand and on order, uh, are important, and recognizing uh, that it's not just uh, election-specific hardware. Uh, many states have very strict uh, requirements around testing and certification. Uh, the, the tested and certified exact configurations need to be what uh, is deployed down to the models of, of laptops, and there may be spot shortages, there may be uh, endemic shortages of particular models of off-the-shelf hardware from typical providers in this industry, such as Dell. Uh, regardless, you will often find that their lead times have gone out and prices, uh, as I mentioned, have gone up as well. Uh, those things conspire to, uh, to harm our county customers. Uh, one thing to do, once again, put things in writing, have contracts in place, uh, have orders in place uh, just as quickly as possible, uh, in addition to those communications uh, and forecasts. Those things help to, to resolve the problems. And then having evaluations and looking ahead, as, as Jim mentioned with respect to paper, uh, 2022 is certainly not the end of the situation. Experts uh, around the globe uh, with respect to supply chain do not see the, the hardware supply chain situation abating uh, anytime soon and, and probably not uh, even on election day in November of 2024. So between now and then, uh, receiving new uh, election hardware, uh, be that off the shelf or purpose built, um, receiving additional uh, units to, to account for such things as population increases, uh, may not be as easy, in fact, probably won't be as easy uh, as, it been, as it has been uh, in years past. So, so certainly something to think about as you interact with the many vendors that you have. And when you look at, at things like the, uh, the infographic that was presented earlier, one of the comments there and in the associated papers is that you probably have more vendors than you think, uh, especially on the services side as well as hardware, software, um, Probably your paper vendors are pretty well defined, but the number of entities providing services, providing hardware to your election offices around your states is probably greater than the counties know. And just like uh, securing assets for cybersecurity, one of the first things to do is take inventory and understand where you are and what your supply chains look like. Those are very important. And the idea behind this infographic was to put in, a, in very short sentences items that counties can do, county procurement offices, county election offices, to operationalize supply chain risk management and to put that in, in simple terms. The white papers that we wrote, when you boil them down, you find that most of the pages of each of those is questionnaires or are questionnaires that you can uh, use at the state and county level 
to assess your supply chains, readiness and capabilities to protect you through supply chain risk management and integrity assurance. Uh, this next slide just boils down services. The infographic is a bit of an eye chart, uh, so please go out uh, to the CISA website and get it. And with that, uh, I thank you and turn it over to Ms. Brown. Um, so again, I'm Ms. Shia Brown and I am with the uh, Michigan Bureau of uh, Elections working specifically with election security. Um, I want to first take a second to thank Amy for the invitation to speak today and to discuss a major issue that is causing um, challenges in the election sector. Um, supply chain disruptions can seriously affect the security of an election, so having practices in place to mitigate the risk are extremely important. I want to first say, um, Ed and Jim, we are going to overlap on on some of the subjects we uh, touch on, especially like um, the risks that are involved with all of these areas. But the difference is I'm coming from the Michigan perspective where Michigan is a de decentralized state, um, making it uh, making us have a bit more risks um, and a bit more disruptions because we have so many vendors and over 1,600 locals. So in this presentation, um, I'll discuss Michigan's current take on supply chain risk and how we work to avoid the disruptions in the state, um, especially because our state is decentralized, as I stated before, and we have a number of vendors, large and small, in our supply chain. I want to highlight the risk to the election supply chain, um, the mitigation techniques that we recommend throughout our state and the best practices that we provide our locals, um, as well as highlight um, vendor tracking and what practices that we believe are effective when it comes to trying to track, monitor, and contingency plan. And I will also touch on, sorry, the importance of accuracy, logic and accuracy testing and how it can be used as um, a checkpoint when you are uh, dealing with supply management. So um, again, touching on some of the same topics that Jim and Ed touched on, there are uh, many risks to the election, election supply chain, um, as we've seen in the previous presentation. So Michigan is structured different, as I stated before. We have additional risk factors that we have to consider when we're planning for the elections, um, just because we are decentralized and there are more than 1,600 locals that we deal with. Um, so by having such a large number of jurisdictions, um, we use a variation of software, hardware, and paper supply. So our emergency response planning and contingency planning are really really key to um, us having successful elections and for managing the supply chain issues and disruptions. So as far as mitigation techniques go, um, as everyone knows, like there are tons of global supply chain issues right now, holding up um, things like computer chips. Even just the other day, I had issues getting a replacement garage door. Um, so uh, these issues are making long-term long -term and short-term planning much more challenging. And in an attempt um, to mitigate the supply chain issues in Michigan, we're recommending that our locals create tra tracking sheets, which um, detail detail inventory and the vendors that they're currently using. Um, the tracking sheet should provide the date ranges for orders, the anticipated cost that they expect for the orders. Um, also, uh, in the tracking sheet, outline any security concerns from a particular line item that there might be. Um, if that item is missing on election day, how that would affect the security of the election or if the election can take place at all without that certain item. So um, making sure that you give each item a level of security. Um, these sheets can be helpful because uh, many times there are things that we forget about when dealing with contingency planning for uh, the supply chain, such as the cost, um, the increased cost was something that I know a lot of our locals didn't um, realize that they would deal with with supply chain disruptions. Um, and those costs come from things such as uh, not being able to order a product that you've been ordering at a specific price point, and now you're ordering an alternative item to cover this place, and it's more expensive, especially now with the current market. So we'll discuss more of those techniques on um, more dealing specifically with the pricing and things like that on a later slide. Um, 
I did want to acknowledge, since it was brought up in the last presentation by CISA um, about the last mile posters, um, we actually use those in Michigan a lot. I actually love those last mile posters and the variety of them, specifically the um, election security snapshot. Uh, we use that for planning for the entire year looking forward, and that is huge also for mitigating risk as far as the supply chain is concerned. Um, this year in our security snapshot, uh, we worked with DA to make sure it had six set initiatives for our locals and a lot of those initiatives, again, I'll discuss those a little bit later, but they go right into um, managing supply chain disruptions if the locals um, complete those initiatives, things like tabletops, which we'll discuss later. Um, so I did want to bring that up, that those posters are extremely helpful. And if your state doesn't utilize them, you definitely should. Our locals love them. Um, we get tons of requests for them because they are able to give us them in the actual big poster size and a digital PDF version. So um, that is just great in general dealing with security, but especially when it comes to supply chain risk, it gives them initiatives literally that they can check off of the list. Again, we have six of those. And in those initiatives, it will help eliminate the risk um, of dealing with supply chain. And some more mitigation um, techniques are um, understanding the budget and uh, which orders will go into which fiscal year is extremely important. Um, you want to make sure that you're financially prepared. So in Michigan, we have some locals that put in um, orders for paper supplies in mid-January 2022. And these orders normally take around four weeks uh, to fulfill, but instead they took months. Um, so we try to stress the importance of ordering supplies early and making sure jurisdictions have the funds to um, cover the increased cost to help eliminate risk. So again, if you need to order something so early that it is now in a fiscal year that you did not plan on it, those are things you kind of got to look ahead for and um, to. So those are things we try to bring up and make it important um, to stress. And that's where the vendor tracking sheet also comes in handy as well. So for example, all states um, hold a November 8th federal election. Um, and with that, we ask, like starting in January, we try to stress the importance, well, starting even the year before, but especially by January, stress the importance of preparation with supplies. Um, and a major initiative that plays a part in our supply chain management in Michigan um, is making it pri a priority to have all of our locals sign up for the EIISAC, which is the Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center. A mouthful. Um, we ask um, individuals to sign up for that just because it is a great information sharing tool. Um, we are able to receive information on software uh, incidents um, early, like for example, the solar wind incidents. We were notified about that early. We got updates in real time along with steps to mitigate um, the damage immediately that our locals all received themselves and then we also received in our office. So that was one of our initiatives for the year is making sure everyone is signed up for that information information sharing network so they can stay in the loop. Um, when you have a decentralized uh, state such as ours, it is hard to keep everyone on the same page. So by having everyone signed up, receiving the same notifications and emails, it kind of keeps us all um, in the know about the same important topics. Um, along with the initiative to join EIISAC in Michigan, we have also added um, two other initiatives for our locals. Again, it's six in all, but for 2022, um, we we have two other initiatives that specifically go with avoiding supply chain disruption. And those initiatives are to have at least one risk assessment um, per year and also one risk assessment per, per year and also participate in an election security workshop or tabletop. Um, each year. So the risk assessment and tabletops allow us to practice our, conti uh, our contingency, contingency plans and ensure that we have backups in place for what's needed. Um, the tabletop, the vote specifically, um, as was previously discussed with CISA, um, is another great tool for us. Um, it's been a great experience for our use in Michigan. They have great scenarios that mimic the current, um, the current market, I guess you'd say. Um, for example, I believe it was last year or the year before, one of the real life scenarios within the tabletop was um, the paper supply um, not being available by the normal vendor and how we would handle it. So we involve our BOE staff along with some of our executive staff and we invite our locals, town, um, our locals, both the county and the township and cities to 
um, be able to be involved in this tabletop exercise with us. So it helps for planning into working out the real scenarios and actually putting those contingency plans um, and emergency response plans in place. Um, now I'm going to discuss a little bit about vendor tracking and um, and how that is also crucial in this process um, about understanding understanding your vendors. Um, it's extremely important part of vendor process uh, of vendor tracking. Um, the vendors in our election display in our election space include voter registration vendors, e-poll book vendors, ballot printing vendors. We can go on for days. Um, but in general, the tracking process is the best way to stay prepared uh, for unforeseen events and to make sure you have your backup plans in place. In Michigan, we have 83 counties, 83 county clerks, and they all um, they use one of three voting systems, which is Hard, Dominion, or ESNS. Um, the counties also choose from a variety of vendors as far as it goes for election supplies so this makes tracking um, so the tracking of the supply chain in Michigan um, extremely important and also a responsibility of our locals that they have to take seriously because we can't do it all from the bureau because again we're so decentralized and there are so many vendors out there um, so it's very important and it's the responsibility of our locals but we like to provide best practices um, that we recommend and we do our trainings and utilize the best practices as well. So in Michigan, we ask for all of our um, election officials to have an emergency response plan. We provide a template of one, um, but they also make it their own by editing in their own local information. Um, we also ask, and it is also one of those six initiatives that we have on that snapshot um, from CISA, which is to... Sorry, I lost my phone which is, sorry, which is to have a continuity of operations plan in place as well. That is, I believe, initiative four in Michigan. Um, so we start with having the locals identify the critical vendors as far as paper, software, um, service, and hardware, um, and then review the vendor's contractual provisions to understand the service level agreements, payment terms, potential legal risk that might come up, and the termination provisions. Then we ask for our locals to establish a communi uh, communication plan with the the key contacts at the vendors, making sure they always have consistent and open communication. And then finally, integrate secondary vendors into the operational activity to reduce the risk um, and to increase the speed that we, we, if we need to pivot for whatever reason or emergency or disruption that happens. So having that all in place. Um, next, we like to evaluate the, we ask the locals to evaluate their ability to insource for certain functions if needed. Um, at least for the short term, it's good to have that, those kind of plans um, available, especially for things such as paper. If you cannot get the paper supply for some reason, try to find a way that you can insource it if possible. Um, next, we advise for um, we advise to monitor. We advise our locals to make sure that they're monitoring the vendors and not just tracking them. As far as the monitoring goes, that is making sure that you're keeping up with their corporate health um, and their cybersecurity practices. Um, this is a step that I find extremely important and that is important to be a part of that EII SAC election infrastructure sharing network because um, again you're more likely to be in the loop and hear about your vendors court you can hear about their corporate help or cybersecurity practices or issues that they're having in the cybersecurity space if you're a part of that information sharing network um, that network has been key in Michigan um, for providing us updates in the election sector. Again, as I stated before, like the I'd like to use the solar winds example because we found out about it pretty early. And again, they provided mitigation tools from that just being part of the EII SAC. Um, I'd also like to touch on logic and accuracy testing and why it's an important, important part of the process when managing the supply chain. Um, the logic and accuracy test ensure that all the voting equipment that is being used and <clears throat> excuse me, that is being used for the elections is working properly um, because this test is completed prior to the election. It's a great opportunity for you to work with your locals and ensure for, for them to verify that they have all the supplies they need on election day and our election day ready. They can use the test um, as one of the many checkpoints on inventory um, before the election to ensure that they have all the equipment and supplies needed. 
um, the logic and accuracy test is also a great time uh, to use the contingency plan um, and just making sure that you have it and checking off the list. Um, when you have an emergency backup in place and want to verify you have the supply um, needed for any mishaps, that is a great time to also do that, marking off the list during that test, just um, noting with your locals, like, if this item were missing or if we're low on this, what will we do on an actual election day um, rather than it just being the logic and accuracy test? And lastly, uh, we stress for our locals to remember um, the biggest part for me to remind locals as far as vendor tracking goes is just because you have a vendor, it does not mean that you don't have a responsibility to know what's going on. Um, it's the local's responsibility to know what's going on and to keep that open dialogue. Um, and ongoing communication is extremely important. So we also try to st stress that with our locals um, to communicate with vendors and have that open line of communication so that when issues do arise, number one, you know about it before it's too late. Um, and then also so you can work, create workarounds when it is necessary. And that is the end of the presentation on uh, supply chain risk and disruptions, especially from the Michigan perspective. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much. That was really uh, informative and helpful. I know I have a couple of questions, and I'm sure others, too. Um, Ashia, first of all, I wanted to apologize for mispronouncing your name during the introduction, so my apologies Happens for that. Happens every day. You're fine. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and I was really excited that you were going to be presenting on this today because I think Michigan and Wisconsin, we have a lot in common in terms of how we operate elections, and they're very decentralized. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or tips, and you offered some really good step-by-steps that I'm certainly gonna take back with me. Um, but has there been anything particularly effective from your perspective in getting information from the locals about the challenges or the potential shortages that they might be facing? Are you, do you feel like they're being forthcoming or maybe aware of is a better way to phrase it of some of those risks and how do you collect sort of that um, uh, information from them in such a decentralized system because that's something we do struggle with too. Sure. Um, you said, are like, are they aware? I think a good example from Jim and Ed's presentation was they are aware. A lot of times I get the questions about certain things because um, questions about certain areas of the supply chain and are there disruptions just specifically off of misinformation, as they mentioned before. A lot of our locals have their ear to the street and it's not necessarily uh, correct information, but they are hearing about it, so they're constantly asking. Um, specifically in Michigan, we have a couple of mailboxes set up for things like that. We have a misinformation mailbox, so we get lots of emails um, asking us from our locals specifically, um, is this an issue, is this something I should prepare for? But in general, um, they because we do have an election security specialist, which a lot of states don't have put into place, um, it's something that they know to contact me directly about if it's going to be an issue or just to ask the question, is this something that you're hearing? And then I use our federal partners and the election security team that we've built, which is um, tons of federal partners and state partners, to verify if that information is true and if that specific area of the supply chain has any issues. Um, that answers the first part. I'm sorry, can you repeat the second part of your question? I think that pretty much covers all of it because I think it's more of the, you know, I, like you pointed out, that's kind of how we do it too is we have a point of contact and, you know, somebody that they know and trust and can come to with these questions and then we sort of put the wheels in motion to connect them with resources. So. Thank you. And I do want to add to that. Um, as Jonathan mentioned it earlier in our other session about the um, election demonstration lab that we're currently creating. And I believe we stole the idea from you. I had it in my notes that it was something <laughs> that you all did something like a, a full election demonstration. Um, we are working on this uh, huge project in conjunction with our Department of Technology Management and Budget Department. 
with this project. Um, it is allowing us to interact with our locals in a different way. Um, the end goal is to have a huge election lab and demonstrate for the public Michigan's election process. But in the in-between time, we're using it to communicate with our locals. We are going to all our local clerk conferences, um, setting up the demonstration, which is 10 huge sandwich boards that lay out the security risk at the, the process and then the security risk at certain steps of the election process, even dealing with logic and accuracy testing down to ballot printing. We have all the stations marked off. What we are asking our locals to do is come in, walk through the process, see how we've written the process along with their safeguards and basically tell us what we're missing or what they're dealing with that we don't know about. Is there, is there anything that we are missing as the Bureau that we don't understand that is challenging them at a local level? Um, we've presented at one conference so far and it went great. We got a lot of good information and found out about some supply risk right there at the session, um, which helped us then change some of our best practices to make sure that we um, advise our locals, like make sure you are, are ordering these certain supplies earlier than normal because it is a risk at this time. So I think just opening up the dialogue with the locals and having a safe space for them to come give us their gripes, um, but also at the same time, inform us about issues that we don't know that they're dealing with at their level is a good thing to happen. That's great, thank you so much. Sure. Um, any other questions for our panel? If I could. Uh, oh, please, oh, Brad, sorry. yes. Yes, if I could follow up uh, on uh, that question with regard to um, making locals aware of the, the potential risks involved, uh, not just in 2022, but in the years going forward. Um, we've certainly in Indiana taken the opportunity to generally alert our counties, we're essentially a county centralized state, uh, about supply chain issues, particularly with paper products, but you know the others, uh, other factors you've mentioned. Um, I'm afraid in, in our case, it's rather like issuing a, a tornado watch. <laughs> in, in Indiana, you don't get up off the couch or out of the chair unless there's a tornado warning and you hear the siren. Right. <laughs> then you take it seriously. Um, the point I'm coming to is I wonder if uh, there is a resource for uh, local individuals to contact their peers in other states who have had actual experiences during the first half of this year with primaries or perhaps even in 2021 uh, in special election setting so that they can understand it is a real risk that could happen to them. You ask, is there a resource for that? Yes. As far as a specific resource, the best resource that I believe that we found in Michigan and the easiest to get all of our locals to get on board for, again, we have more than 1,600, so to get everybody to kind of line up is a challenge. It's the EII SAC. It's that information sharing um, network. Uh, it's free, so I like to highlight that. And then we also, I drill it into everyone's head. Um, that's something we ask you to sign up for. Our election workshops that we do with our locals, that is the first slide. Like like we'll give you five minutes to take this time right now to sign up for the election information sharing network. Um, and they do. And then a lot of times individuals hear about stuff. Sometimes they'll get the email before me and contact me like, did you hear? So it's great seeing that we all know about the same issues as they're coming up. And again, I find them as a great resource because they're on it immediately. And then the best part about it is they're not just telling you about the issue that has arose. They're giving you some mitigation techniques and some contacts to reach out for. So. Um, that is the tool that I feel like works the best, uh, especially within all of the states. Um, we use them to report issues as well. So if we know about an issue or something that arises, we report that that we're dealing with. And then they then log that to share with other states. And when other states do that and so on and so forth, it keeps happening. So we're all in the same loop nationally. I think that's very encouraging. I just want to follow up on one point, and that is I'm assuming that you found that locals who've experienced these problems are not shy or embarrassed about coming forward and sharing their experiences for the benefit of others. Not at all. They are not. <laughs> In addition to that, uh, Jim and I co-developed some slides which I presented to the Election Center uh, at their meeting in Houston. I believe it was in April. Uh, and so the Election Center is, is trying to address that. And as many know, uh, there's a number of county staff uh, present uh, at their meetings and in their organization. Uh, so um, I'm about to say a compliment. You guys should all write down the date and time. Uh, 
So uh, Jim is uh, doing wearing his SCC uh, cap right now, but his uh, evening job is working for Runbeck. Um, uh, Runbeck, I thought uh, you guys really walk the walk when it comes to supply chain um, issues because um, they were pushy as hell uh, getting <laughs> the counties to meet deadlines and uh, getting us to hound the counties about meeting deadlines associated with um, this last primary election, and that continues in our conversations about the coming years. Um, and I think that's really important. I, if, if my advice to you is if you're uh, working with a smaller print vendor or you have counties or jurisdictions that are working with smaller print vendors, uh, they really need to be um, working very closely with those vendors and, and trying to understand their limitations, understand their timelines. Um, because we had some uh, smaller vendor issues in this last primary election one which really threw off a county. Um, and we didn't have that with any of the runback counties. And I think it was because they were so organized and they were so sort of in the faces of the counties and frankly, in our lap on that stuff too. So I appreciate that. And it really put us in a good position in the majority of our county. Hey, so one question that I have um, in, in Georgia, the the setup that we have for uh, a lot of our printing is that we do it at the state level and then uh, we'll take requests from counties for uh, for different documents and we'll supply those to counties, which is a little bit of a, of, of a difficult um, setup. Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy for us to have a knowledge of what our inventory is, but if there's a county that waits until the last minute and perhaps you know we're not aware of it and, and then they ask us for something that normally we provide if it's a large quantity you know it could put us in a difficult situation so we've tried to stay out ahead of this um we've tried to make sure that we've stayed in tune with what county inventories are and that kind of thing um, but looking ahead in the next year and a half two years you know we're already looking ahead we do a lot of list maintenance activities in, t in odd years and so we're preparing for that we've already put a paper order uh, and to be able to to have that, um, but also looking back at our experiences over the past six months or so and working with our vendor, um, you know, it's it's frustrating for our vendor and frustrating for us at times when we've had to delay potential mailings because of um, supply issues. Um, and and what my initial response was kind of at the beginning is. Well, just go find another supplier, you know, <laughs> like let us know, get some quotes, let us know what the cost is and that kind of thing. Um, but the response that I got back was that, you know, that's the, the problem is kind of the, the root of the problem is that, you know, kind of the, the mills and, and that, that they're, you know, it's not as simple as finding another supplier and that kind of thing. So, I mean, I guess, is that kind of what y'all are seeing too, is that the problem is, is kind of at the mills and kind of creating the paper and that kind of thing and then getting them to suppliers? And then, um, you know, also I, th I think back just from a personal kind of consumer level, I remember back in COVID, you know, when pe places were like, you know, don't, uh, don't hoard paper, don't, don't, uh, don't go and buy, you know, 10 packs of toilet paper and that kind of thing. I mean, we're, we're looking ahead. We're trying to make sure that we order enough. We're, we're scared to order too little. Um, but is, I mean, is that something that you're concerned with too? You know, places just buying huge quantities of paper potentially hoarding because we're, we're scared to death to run out and that kind of thing. Okay, uh, um, that last part of your question, and, and first of all, thank you, Judd, for your comments, uh, uh, most appreciated. I will continue with my SCC hat to encourage everyone to continue push your jurisdictions on these orders. And uh, as far as people hoarding paper, uh, this is uncoated paper that we're talking about here, both for envelopes, inserts, and or ballots. And there's not enough paper to hoard. So uh, it is not happening, uh, I can uh, assure you. So, um, and the first part of your question, uh, more was a comment. I, I do tip my hat to your leadership of staying on top of your jurisdictions, though, to make sure their supplies are in order, making sure they're uh, ordering ahead of time. Uh, this will not uh, go away at the end of this year for sure. And uh, so 
uh, we're cautious. We make sure that we're going to have our paper orders in, and we don't believe it until it's actually on the floor in our facility that that paper has arrived. We are still waiting on orders to arrive the end of this month and next month. So uh, if I miss something in the first part of your comments or you have another question, uh, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, I have a sort of a follow up to Blake's question, I guess, and I'll ask Ed and Jim because I can ask Ashia later. Um, so, uh, like, it, we're all putting in all this effort. You're rightly notifying us that we need to get our, you know, our, our local jurisdictions to make their orders earlier and earlier. Um, it seems like the trend is that there's going to be even less paper in the future. I mean, given that the, the, those who are producing this are not finding it profitable to produce this as much as other things. Um, I mean, it seems like we're already in a bad position and it seems like it's trending in the wrong direction. I mean, I guess this is just a basic question, like how many paper mills are there? Um, and at a certain point, I mean, the, the amount of paper that we all need for an election cycle, I don't know if we know that number, but it seems to be pretty predictable over a two year or four year cycle, like especially for something like ballots, how many nationwide we're gonna need um, I understand we're probably not important enough to have like a strategic paper reserve or something like that, but I mean, or do we need something more like that, like for, from a cross industry solution? Because it seems like it's getting worse, and what we're doing now is already challenging and may not even be effective at a certain point. So the uh, mills, the the number of mills, I, I couldn't actually identify exactly the number of mills uh, out there producing paper, but I will tell you. Uh, the demand for this uncoated paper has been reducing over decades, and it's for uncoated paper, uh, and it's also for newsprint paper. So that demand, and it's not the election industry, it's just our entire country, it's our entire nation. Uh, those two, those two uh, buckets of paper have just been in a trend going downward. Uh, where this is going forward is that the mills are now very aware of bodies like yourselves, uh, NAS as well, and then just the election industry in general, and they are, they are paying attention, they are willing partners, and they do want to solve this. And so they are, they are looking and, and prioritizing our orders and making sure they're as best they can to get fulfilled. So it is, it has come to their attention and, and they are very much engaged. So that's, that's the good news. Thanks for all of your comments so far. It's it's interesting. Um, Karen and I, who just stepped out, were on um, a discussion on Twitter with Politico um, a couple of weeks ago on supply chain, um, and some of you may have listened to that. Um, in Ohio, I my state law prohibits me from printing ballots um, out of state, so my supply chain is already limited vis-a-vis uh, -vis our state law prohibition. Um, We've had to put serious timeline requirements into our election official manual, our permanent directives, so that the county boards are meeting all of the timelines as it pertains to outsourcing absentee ballots and printing ballots. Um, and we found that that's been very successful. What we have found, particularly given redistricting, is this you know, bizarre, oh, we're just gonna have an unplanned statewide primary um, in the middle of a cycle. And, um, you know, how, how does a supply chain, you know, issue impact that? And, you know, have you guys, I know run back, obviously you're out of state, so I can't work with you. Um, but have you noticed in any other states like this? I, I'm not sure anyone's had it as bad as Ohio. Um, but, you know, from the standpoint of, I mean, I've had to send out, we've had to send out supplemental ballots with additional candidates. So now, voters, you know, have an original ballot and a supplemental ballot with candidates that were either added or subtracted. Um, and how has that impacted? I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. So you're not alone. Uh, Ohio's not alone in that they have uh, restrictive uh, laws uh, for 
printing ballots within the state, but it, it does put you at more risk for options. And, and so um, I'm sure there's ways around that. You all can manage that for emergency needs for sure. Uh, and then also to uh, the benefit of even though you're having unplanned primaries, at least they're happening in the middle of the year. So even though we are in this supply chain crunch for paper, uh, it's able to be addressed. There's a chance to address it. It's just as we're working up to really September is what I'm talking about as we get into the November election cycle that everyone will be on the same election cycle. So that's the biggest issue we're trying to make sure we're in front of. You know, I used the word uh, operationalize uh, earlier, and I think that is a real word. Uh, as we move through July into August and, and set forth those uh, ballot print orders, it is imperative that counties do everything they can to proof their ballots because those last minute changes, which we know can be imposed by courts and such, and you don't have much control over it, but last minute orders associated with uh, uh, proofing defects, you know, holes, that errors on the ballot that get through proofing um, could really hurt your counties. Uh, so proofing, processes around proofing uh, really need to be watertight uh, this season. Uh, a question I had for, well, I guess for any of the panelists, but I'll direct it at Ed to start with, is with the development of uh, VVSG 2.0, uh, do you think that supply chain issues are going to have any downstream effects on the ability for jurisdictions to implement the VVSG 2.0? Probably. Because uh, the electronic supply chain issues probably will not abate by the time we have the intersection of those issues and availability of VVSG 2.0 equipment. Uh, so you once again will see increased lead times and higher costs for equipment uh, that is compliant to the new standards. That's my guess. Any thoughts on how we mitigate that? I mean, as we're all thinking about the future of voting systems and meeting those new um, VVSG guidelines, you know, any thoughts about, uh, I guess, what that means for us or ways that we can mitigate that? The root issues aren't specific to VVSG 2.0 or any of the requirements and clauses in it. So, uh, I don't have a good answer to your question. A number of my colleagues in the industry are here, and, and so uh, over adult beverages, that's a good topic of conversation. But I, I think it's independent of, of VVSG 2.0. Other questions? Yes, please. OK, so I got, I got one more, and I might need this explained like a you know like I'm five or something but uh, so just in trying to understand the big picture so I, I, I get that there's a problem with with the paper with paper and supply chain issues and I, and I understand that it might be another you know two to three years or so um, before things are back to normal but I guess my question is just to help me kind of understand the big picture like what's the path forward to get things back to normal I mean, is it just we got to cut down more trees and pr you know produce more paper? I mean, what's what's kind of just high level the path forward for things to normalize? And, and I mean, are we looking? Is it is it looking like okay, 2026 things should be normal, or are you not that optimistic? Uh, Jim and I are going to split this, and I'll, I'll take uh, hardware, uh, and he'll take take paper. Uh, let me go. Back to front with your questions. By 2026, I, I certainly think and, and hope so uh, that things will be back more to uh, traditional supply chain tempo and, and availability of, of electronic goods. Uh, I think so. Uh, you know, at, there are certainly efforts uh, worldwide to iron out the, the disruptions uh, in the supply chain, uh, but it's going to take some time. We've all seen the, the photos of, of ships lined up off the port of Long Beach and, and such to, to offload their, their cargoes. And, and we are still facing worldwide uh, shutdowns uh, of factories, uh, areas uh, in Asia and elsewhere that uh, limit production. 
uh, and, and candidly, there are a number of people who have died uh, from the pandemic. And uh, at least some of those people were producing or somehow involved in supply chain activities. Um, and then we see people not returning to the workforce that were involved in uh, stevedoring and, and transportation uh, and such. Uh, that, that crosses over into the paper discussion as well. So it, it is going to take some time to iron it out. There are a number of people working uh, in many capacities in government and in industry to iron it out. And, and so eventually, at least uh, speaking on electronics hardware, I predict it will iron out. And as far as the paper supply chain for our industry, uh, I would, it's, it's not going to change for the next 17 months that we're looking at here. We, we have to be planning and shooting for December 2023. So, you know, back to after November here of, um, after November election, we're, we're down to 12, 13 months to have our paper supplies uh, in place. So after that, after 2024, I do see it normalizing, but this market is still reacting to uh, the COVID and supply chain issues from 2020. So if you have a follow-up question, I, I'm open. I have one, let me make one. No, Let me make good. one, uh, one follow-on remark. Unlike paper, where you see production of, of the particular sorts of paper we need uh, in the electricity ecosystem declining, no one's given up their silicon. We might be giving up our paper pulp, but no one's giving up our silicon, right? In fact, you're going to have more of it and, and convergence of devices, just as we've seen with, with phones uh, that used to be so many separate devices now are in one. Uh, worldwide demand for better, stronger, faster, cheaper electronics is going to do nothing but increase. And like any enterprising um, people, uh, people are going to go in and, and fill that demand, which, which will help the supply chain to iron out, at least for electronic hardware. All right, any other questions? Not seeing any, uh, I want to thank you all so much for being here and for that really great discussion. You know, I think it's really important that we share information about some of these challenges. So thank you so much for being willing to have that conversation with us and for bringing us an update from the SEC too about uh, some of the work happening there. So thank you very much for being here today. We thank you. Thank you.